Hello and welcome back to Summerlin Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're joining us online. We've just finished a series on prayer and we're going into a new series and uh, there's a connection between the two. We finished the series on prayer, which was, if you didn't see it, it's more about living in the presence of God, prayer as life. More than prayer as saying prayers or prayer as asking things or even prayer as conversation with God, all of those, of course, are legitimate. But it was more about uh, waiting on the presence of God, uh, about realizing the one necessary thing uh, that Mary realized, which was to be open to the teachings of Jesus, to be open to the Spirit of God in her real life. And so we ended it by talking about a life of prayer in this sense of the word would be to be rooted in eternity while living in the presence living in the present, excuse me, rooted in eternity, rooted in God, rooted in love, rooted in spirit, rooted in something so much more profound than the little things that we try to do to make our life happen, but rooted there in order to actually live out our daily lives. And it made me realize, because I used a scripture from the Apostle Paul, where he talked about being rooted and established in Christ. It's in the letter that he wrote near the end of his life to some believers in Turkey in a little town called Colossae. And it's a four-chapter letter, uh, literally a letter that he wrote, he dictated. And, and in it, he, he hits some of the high watermarks, in my opinion, of his thinking. And so we're going to take a look at that letter, uh, not in the traditional way. I'm not going to read through each chapter and go through each uh, sentence, although that could be a worthy undertaking. But I'm going to try to uh, look at it more like a tapestry and find out where the key threads are and how they tie together. And of course, you know the Apostle Paul uh, actually didn't know the physical Jesus, we don't think, but he had a mystical experience, you might call it, where he, he met the risen Christ when he was on his way to actually uh, persecute the very followers of Jesus. He had this turnaround, which we'll look into a little bit more later, and, and he became a devoted follower of Jesus and traveled all over the Mediterranean, which is what brought him into Turkey, although he never actually visited the town that he wrote this letter to. And he, he was full of this changed heart from a very academic, uh, strongly theological, very legalistic uh, perspective of his own uh, tradition, the, the Jewish faith, and in, in particular the Pharisaical version of that. And then he was transformed into this freedom and grace and love person. The change was this experience he had with the risen Christ. Later in his life, when he's writing this letter to the Colossians, he he tries to explain that, and I think does it so beautifully. Well, we're going to look at four major threads. We may find a few more as I go along. That happens to me. But the first is, who is Christ? The second is, in light of who Christ is, according to Paul, who are we? I mean, who is Christ, and, and who are we, and are the two connected in some way? And third, what has Christ done for us, or, or with us, or in us? And fourth, what are we meant to do or be in response to what Christ has been for us? Those are kind of the, the, the big themes we're going to look at. Who is Christ we're going to look at today from the Apostle Paul's perspective? And believe me, we're only going to scratch the surface. And I've got a question for you. Four things. You tell me what they have in common. One, a nuclear reactor core. Two, a grouping of dirt, oxygen, sunlight, and water. Three, a new mother with her newborn baby. Four, a soldier, a professional soldier, who all of a sudden is called up to be deployed into a conflict zone. You've got it, right? Reactor core, dirt, oxygen, sunlight, and water, a new mother with her baby, and a soldier called up to active duty in a conflict. Each one of those is so important that it changes everything else. 
The reactor core. You don't have a reactor core, you don't have a reaction. You don't have nuclear energy. You don't have any energy coming out. I'm talking about peaceful means here. Dirt, oxygen, sunlight, and water. Without all four of those things, you don't have any plants, which means you don't have any oxygen, which means you're not going to be around very long. So crucial to everything. A new mother with her baby. I just saw one yesterday walking with a stroller. And, I mean, there's no question. You look in a new mother's eyes, and her entire life has changed. So has the father's, but arguably much more the mother's. She knows what the central purpose of her life is. Everything she does in a day will be figured out around that child. It changes everything. And a soldier who's been training and training and training, and all of a sudden there's a shooting war, and he or she is called up, everything else changes. Family, priorities, what you were planning to do next week or next month or next year. This is the kind of centrality that Paul felt whenever he talked about Jesus. He felt like it changed everything. Uh, nothing could be the same again once a person had experienced the living Christ. Not, not just thoughts about Christ or thoughts about God or thoughts about Messiah or thoughts about the Spirit, but experientially knowing in the sense of you've tasted it, touched it, felt it, which is exactly what the Apostle John said uh, he and his friends had done when they were with the real, live, flesh and blood Jesus of Nazareth. So for Paul, everything changed when he ran into Jesus Christ, the risen version. So he writes about him. And I want to pick it up, not at the beginning of Colossians. It's actually in the first chapter. Remember, there's only four chapters. Honestly, you could, I listened to this on, uh, I went to BibleGateway.com. I put in Colossians 1 through 4, and I pushed the little button that says there's a speaker there. And it goes to audio, and it's read beautifully by one of my favorite readers, Max McLean. And I think it takes, I didn't measure it exactly, maybe 20 minutes, I think probably even less, somewhere around that, to listen to all four chapters. You might try that. But in the, in the middle of chapter 1, this is what we hear Paul say. Now Christ is the visible expression of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of God's fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Wow. There's a lot packed into those few sentences. You realize you're dealing with a great mind when you read the Apostle Paul. Whether you like him or don't like him, agree with him or don't agree, uh, the man was clearly a genius. Now Christ, he says, was the visible expression of the invisible God. That's the Phillips translation. Uh, the New International says the Son, meaning Jesus the Christ, the Son is the image of the invisible God. What does this tell us about who Paul thinks Christ is? And, and later on we're going to look at the role of Jesus and the phrase Christ. But for today we're going to think of them as synonymous. Well, if Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God, that tells us two things. One, we already know God is invisible. What God has created is not invisible. The earth, the, the universe, the uh, macrocosm, the microcosm, everything. So we, we can tell a lot about God by what God has created. But God in his own self is invisible. 
So how would we know what God is like? Well, we could look at creation and pick up some hints. Uh, we could listen to people who said they've been sent by God, named prophets, but then there's also false prophets, so that gets a little tricky. But what if God, in God's own planning for our lives, decided to visit this planet and fully invest God's own self in one human being who happened to be Jesus of Nazareth. Then we could see what God was like, the invisible God, by what Jesus was doing and saying and, and refusing to do also. We could learn what God is like. If you take a look at Jesus, uh, I, I don't see how you could be anything but captivated by the real Jesus. Not, not the plastic Jesus or the institutional Jesus or the real religious Jesus. I'm talking about the actual Jesus that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about and that Paul had a mystical experience with. And then he talked to those apostles, many of them at least, about their experience with the actual physical Jesus. And Paul's favorite phrase is the phrase, in Christ. I think he uses it 185 times in his letters. <laughs> that tells you something. Being in Christ, he says, that was, he didn't use the term Christian hardly at all. Uh, in fact, he actually uh, never used it. But he talked about being in Christ as, his, as the key matrix for a relationship with God. Why is this? Because for him, Christ was the visible expression of the invisible God. So you want to know, is God... Uh, an angry, mean God? Look at Jesus. Is Jesus angry and mean as you read the pages of the New Testament, especially the Gospels? No. Is he harsh? No. Uh, is he exclusivistic? No. Quite the opposite. In fact, he got in trouble for letting too many people uh, sort of come in, so to speak, out of the rain. So Jesus, uh, one scholar said, and I, I literally, I was trying to remember exactly where it was, but I couldn't pick, get, it, get it to come back into my brain. But I remember reading one scholar saying that if God wasn't like Jesus, he ought to be. That was a great statement. Well, of course, in Paul's view, God and Jesus are synonymous. It's just that one is fully orbed and, and is outside just the three dimensions of our life, and the other is fully visible, now through history and through the Holy Spirit, which we'll talk about later. So he's the visible expression of the invisible God. So that tells you one thing you need to know, which is get to know Jesus of Nazareth, the, the real one, that you can read about him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four key books about his life. But then listen to this. He says, for in him, that is in Christ, all things were created. All things have been created through him. All things have been created for him. And all things hold together in him. That's a mouthful and beautifully worded. All of creation, according to Paul, was created through Christ. So obviously Christ is a bigger concept than only the 30 some years, probably 33 years that we had of Jesus on the earth. It's much more expansive than that. All of creation, Christ not only had something to do with it, but according to Paul, all of creation came through Christ, a, a radical claim. And all of creation was created for Christ. So it was created through him, he did it, and it was created, it finds its ultimate expression in him, which is another bold statement. The whole universe, everything that's in it, everyone that's ever lived, everyone that's ever going to live, planets we don't even know about, somehow have their culmination point, according to Paul, in Christ. And then third, in him, all things hold together. Through him, all things are created. For him, all things were created. In him, all things hold together. You know, the great physicists of our time, and probably from Einstein on, have been looking for what they call a theory of everything. One mathematical uh, expression that would somehow, in very simple forms, a little like E equals mc squared, but for everything, not just for light and energy, 
would pull everything together. Well, for Paul, it's Christ. I know that can sound kind of simplistic, but it's not. For Paul, all of the whole universe, of course, he didn't know about quasars and dark holes and all that, but he could see the stars. It all held together in Christ. But maybe more importantly for you, for me, is that our lives are held together by Christ. That, that's what holds them together. The closer we are with, with Jesus, with Christ, with the Spirit, with God, the more our lives adhere to some central meaning and purpose. And the less suffering there is, at least the needless suffering. Then he goes on to say, uh, Christ has the supremacy in all things. I love the, the uh, motto of the college I used to work at, Westmont College. The, the motto was, we hold Christ preeminent in all things, which they took from this verse, from the Latin version of this verse. Christ is preeminent in all things, and therefore he's meant to be preeminent in our lives. And, it, and Paul goes on to say, the fullness of God dwelt in him. Now, think of these huge statements. Creation came through him. Creation is there for him. All things hold together in him. The fullness of God dwelt in Jesus, and in a later place he'll say bodily. And finally, this fullness dwelling within Christ manages to reconcile all things to himself. I, I worked uh, around a lot of uh, international leaders for a number of years, and every time I talked to them, we worked a lot in Latin America and some in the Middle East, and I'd say, what's the biggest problem you're facing? In one way or another, they would say alienation or corruption or... Uh, uh, bad leadership, egocentricity, egocentric leadership. There, there's something broken at the heart of it all that's unreconciled. It, it, it doesn't click. And so, sadly, after all these years of humanity being on the earth, we still haven't figured out a better way to solve our differences than by having our grandchildren go, go kill one another. That's our big solution. Put guns in the hands of 20-year-olds and have them kill each other. That's unreconciled living. That, that's tragic. But in Christ, Paul says, Jesus somehow on that cross reconciled all things to himself. Now, interestingly, he didn't say that all things were recon themselves were reconciled. He says, he reconciled them to himself. God is reconciled with you. You may be worried about it, but you don't need to be. God is reconciled. As my, one of my favorite quotes from Dallas Willard is, all the arrangements have been made. You're safe. The question is, are you reconciled to God, not is God reconciled to you? He's completely reconciled to you. And we're going to look into that further in this series. But all of this is centered in Christ. So, so we learn that we're meant to live from the source. We're meant to live for the source, not only from the source, but for the source. And we're able to hold our lives together because of the source, which is the Christ. And we know that we're all recon already reconciled to God in Christ. So I have four questions to leave you with. If we're already reconciled, and if, if, if Christ is behind all these things we see and all the mystery of what happens after this life and all the unanswered questions we all have, how can there be a loving God and yet there be so many tragic things in the world? If somehow this, this deep mystery of Christ is holding all that together and offering us the reconciliation that's already completed, my first question is, have you received it? Have you received it? You've been reconciled to God. From God's side, it's all reconciled. You know, there was the old analogy we used to hear a lot when I was young about the gap between our lives and God and, and that the cross was a, a, a bridge across that. It's a bit simplistic, but it gets a truth across. That from God's side, the bridge is right there, ready for you to walk across. 
have you received the reconciliation, which means the forgiveness and the redemption that's there in Christ? It'll lift a huge burden off. And all you do have to do is accept it. Unwrap the present, walk across the bridge. You pick your analogy. It's waiting for you. You don't have to be better. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to send money anywhere. Right now, wherever you are, you can receive the gift of God's reconciling love. Second question, if you've received it already, or are, are you deepening in it? See, receiving it is the beginning. Now, my second question is, are, are you deepening? Is your life deepening in this reconciliation of God, in this fullness of the Godhead which dwelt in Christ bodily? Are you, are you getting the nutrients from that in your spiritual life? Or are you just gathering information about God and your particular form of religion? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But if it doesn't lead you into a deepening relationship and transformational change, what's the point? Third, there's a question that Dallas Willard asked one time. I said I had four questions. I only have three. <laughs> I was, uh, I'd invited Dallas. He was a USC professor of philosophy and a brilliant writer and author and theologian. And I invited him to speak at the college, at Westmont College, where I was the chaplain at the time. And I never forget, he leaned out over the podium and he started his talk with this question. He literally just went like this and he said to a thousand students and faculty and staff, uh, now what is your plan for becoming like Jesus? You do have one. I was sitting in the front row and I was the chaplain and I thought, I don't think I have one. A little embarrassing when you're getting paid to probably have one, but what's your plan for becoming like Jesus? What is your plan for deepening in Christ? What is your strategy? You have a strategy for your career, you have a strategy for your family, you have a strategy for your finances, you have a strategy for your landscaping. Uh, we plan things out. Why would we not have a plan to become spiritually deepened? If you don't have a plan, maybe this would be a good time to start one. Talk to some people that could help you think it through. Have you received it? Are you deepening in it the love of God? And do you have a plan for allowing it to help you become more and more in your life the way Christ would be in your life? So that's the opening chapter on what did the Apostle Paul think about Jesus Christ? He thought a lot about him. He thought he was the greatest. I hope that you'll take a deeper look at Christ yourself. Amen. From the love of my own comfort From the fear having nothing from a life of worldly passion deliver me oh God from the need to be
from the fear of serving others, from the fear of death or trial, from a fear of you.